Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Welcome to LinkedIn's Women Connect event, a strategic pillar under Women in Tech Group at LinkedIn. I'm Joshwini Pereira. I'm part of the Privacy Engineering Org under Core Eng in LinkedIn, and I'm going to be your MC for this event. I'm super excited to host this 32nd Women Connect event and the third Spotlight event in partnership with Women in Big Data and the Core Eng teams here at LinkedIn. Spotlight is an intimate wit roundtable event aimed at bringing influential thought leaders with, within the women in tech community. Maybe a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to, the, been to a Women Connect event before? Awesome. It's good to see you guys back. And for the rest of you, thank you for being here. Um, some quick background details. Uh, LinkedIn WIT is an employee-led initiative to promote underrepresented genders in technical roles at LinkedIn and to inspire other companies to do the same. Women Connect is a platform for women and technology allies to come together and connect with one another, exchange best practices, and build meaningful relationships. We encourage you to use this time to explore, learn, and build your networks. We also encourage you to post your experience on social media. Uh, we have the WIT website linked here, and please use the hashtags LinkedIn Women Connect and LinkedIn WIT. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. So towards the end of the event, you will see a uh, link for feedback, so please share that with us. And uh, we'll be raffling away LinkedIn premium subscriptions. Um, that will be based on the people who actually submit their feedback, and you have 24 hours to do so. So please make sure you submit your feedback. Um, some housekeeping rules, please make sure to silence your cell phones uh, so that to reduce distractions to our speakers. Um, and finally, uh, we have restrooms uh, right down this corridor on the left-hand side. So please feel free to take breaks. Uh, we don't have that baked into our schedule yet, but feel free to do so. Moving on, this is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll kick off um, this event with an icebreaker ev um, event and a short segment on women in big data. Um, this will be co-hosted by Tina Tang, who is the co-founder and chair at Women in Big Data. Uh, next, we'll jump into a very insightful keynote talks and a discussion on generative AI, uh, which will be led by Hema Raghavan, uh, for the keynote and uh, Javier uh, Amatrian uh, for the generative AI discussion. Uh, we also have lined up three very exciting uh, lightning talks uh, that will be delivered by LinkedIn's very own women in tech uh, individuals. And uh, they, the talks will span across big data and ML and AI topics. Uh, finally, we'll have some closing remarks and then you will have time to uh, work on rocking your profile and there'll be various tables set up for you to do so. And finally, you will also have time for networking and for taking headshots. Um, now, without much further ado, I'd like to invite Tina over. Uh, and to remind everyone, Tina is the co-founder and chair for Women in Big Data. Uh, so Tina, uh, welcome. We, we've been like, <laughs> talking for the last you know, what, three weeks. Yes. Yes, for the last few years. Uh, so, Tina, uh, tell me more about women in big data and how did you, like, what sparked the idea to start it like 13 years, 18 years ago? Okay. Eight years ago. I'm sorry, eight years ago. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. Hi, yes. So, I just want to say thank you for letting me get out of my house. Because I've been working from home for the last, you know, four years. Um, it's great to be here. What a campus. I almost just stopped at the cafe and didn't go any further than that. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. So Women in Big Data, we actually started uh, about eight years ago. And uh, LinkedIn was one of our first uh, corporate partners. So we go way back. Um, we are a, an organization that started um, as just a volunteer group here in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
and then uh, we would, you know, show up at various tech conferences and have lunch talks and, you know, how people come from all over the world. So before we knew it, like um, all the seeds started blowing overseas, down in South America. Um, so currently we have um, participants in uh, chapters, we call them chapters, in uh, across six continents. And um, of course, during the pandemic, we went to mostly uh, virtual. And so sort of the, co the geographical concept is sort of morphing right now. But um, yeah, we have, our participants are all over the world. And it's a really humbling thing to be able to be part of this global community because I think um, we have a universal experience, uh, which is that we're often the only women in the room um, and we don't see enough people who look like us, who have had our perspectives and experiences, who are, you know, um, in the echelons of management leadership. And so Women in Big Data is about that. It's how do we build the next generation of leaders in these fields? How do we develop them, help them develop? How do we mentor and coach? How do we support each other? Um, when we had our first events, um, I think we kind of thought that like the technical aspects would be the most interesting for people, but we quickly learned that that was not the case. It's actually community um, being here, you know, together and just sharing experiences. Um, it, you know, honestly, it was kind of like Oprah the first um, few events. It was just like this outpouring. I mean, I don't know if you experienced that, but. It was just, it was, yeah, very touching. And I think that's the heart that we try to come out with, with all of our programs. We do um, mentoring. We have a mentoring initiative that we actually just kicked off last year. And I think we've mentored uh, somewhere over 700 people so far. So well, 700 people have participated. Some are mentors and some are mentees. And um, we also have uh, meetups, uh, events like this, um, or online um, events. Uh, technical training workshops and um, networking. Uh, yeah, so we hope that we will um, encourage people to sign up for our mentoring um, initiative in, uh, in particular, at, either as a mentor or a mentee or both, because there are a variety of programs and um, you can participate in any way that you feel like you might want to give back um, or receive. So thank you for having me here. Um, what's next is the, yeah, yeah, okay. So you can see that I kind of like was doing Canva late at night and found this template <laughs> and somebody probably should have taken the mouse away from me. But um, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do an icebreaker. And Joshwini was like, okay, yeah, we could try it. <laughs> So this is what we're going to do. Um, please stand up. Come on. And find two or three people around you. Look around, make sure no one gets, you know, left out. That you don't know. Okay, that you don't know. Yeah, come on. I want to see a little bit of a shuffling here, a little movement, please. Here we go. No one is left out. Bring in... and. Anyone that you see that needs a partner, okay. All right, so next, okay, this or that, okay? This is called this or that. So pick a person to go first and you'll ask each other, which do you prefer, coffee or tea, music or podcast? You get, you get how this goes, right? Okay.
All right, we're gonna wrap it up in about 30 seconds. So get those answers. I have a, I keep forgetting. Thank you for playing. Thank you for playing. This is fantastic. Yay, we got up. We learned something about somebody else. Yes. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> okay, so I just have one small call to action ask of each of you. If you feel compelled to um, be a mentor, to be a mentee, Maybe share with someone you know that maybe is interested in being a mentor or a mentee. Um, this is how to reach us, mentoring at womeninbigdata.org, uh, or just go to our website, womeninbigdata.org. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, now I welcome onto the stage Hema Raghavan, who's going to be our keynote speaker for today. Welcome, Hema. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. For those who don't know, I'm an alum of LinkedIn. I left, I think, a year and a half ago uh, to start my own company. I lead engineering at a company called Kumo.ai. And uh, I was at LinkedIn for seven and a half years. And, uh, you know, uh, I've spent about two decades in the, in the field of AI. And I'll, through this talk, I'll actually talk to you about my professional journey and uh, what we're building at Kumo as well, and how that fits in the context of everything AI that you hear these days. Hopefully, there's something for everyone here in this talk, either technical, uh, you take home a tool, you join our open source community, or you, you know, something. So hopefully, uh, I can keep you engaged. But before that, uh, beyond my startup, uh, here's my uh, seven-year-old and 10-year-old, and they keep me super busy. And behind the scenes, I have a great family who refuse to be photographed and on the screen. So, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot more. It takes a village to have two kids and a startup, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the kind of support system that I have. This is the company that we started, uh, I want to say, to in uh, the end of 2021. Uh, bang in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, there are a couple of us here, and we're about 35 strong now. My original professional journey in the AI field started with uh, NLP, and this was over two decades ago. So I had a 500 meg RAM machine, a CPU. This was nowhere, anywhere like the world of NLP you see today, right? And the way we would look at questions in my first paper was in a paper trying to understand whether, a, you know, when you type Java or Apple in a query, whether you're talking about coffee or you're talking about the programming language and so on. And in those little machines, we would have to squeeze part of speech patterns, n-grams, and our language models were really parsimonious. And uh, we had to be really, really efficient. Over the course of the next decade and a half, I continued to work on NLP. And NLP became more and more AI driven. And uh, I worked at, uh, uh, after my PhD, I worked at Yahoo and then IBM Research. And post IBM, I actually came to LinkedIn. Now at LinkedIn, I, uh, I actually came here to do text. And what always excites me is to, Data excites me, and new problems excite me, and I suddenly discovered that there's a whole new world of deeply relational data. And so I took, so while the, all the AI and transformer revolution was happening, and I'm sure uh, Xavier will talk to you about that, and I decided to start working with the social networks relational data. So uh, 
the, the last the seven years that I spent at LinkedIn, we built people you may know, we built a lot of the notification recommendations and so on and so forth. And um, what I'll do through this talk is actually just put the context of what we're doing at Fumo in the context of the larger generative AI conversation that's happening. And uh, I'll take you back to two decades ago. And uh, the way we used to work in our lab in, in the early 2000s was we would have these track competition competitions. I know in this room, uh, Javier will remember those competitions. I think a couple of folks might remember those, but I think most people won't. They would publish a data set and you would try to build a winning system. The winning systems in those, uh, uh, you know, uh, in those days would effectively use a lot of human knowledge about language. So you would encode named entities, you would encode parsers, you would... Uh, and you would actually build in a word sense this is ambiguation logic. And you would put all that together into building your winning system, right? And this took months, if not years of feature engineering to build, right? And uh, here's a sample question, which is what year did Marco Polo travel to Asia? And this was from the winning system, extremely rule-based, right? And we would never win those competitions, by the way, because we were trying to do it with machine learning and we would never win. So it's the rule-based feature engineering-based system that always won in the early 2000s. And you had to understand that travel was an important word and uh, you, know, you have to match it across the two. And then that this is a, a you know, question about what year and time and so on and so forth. So there was just so much knowledge that went in. But today, with the transformers revolution and with and i think uh, we should give enough credit to compute like compute just transformed the way the last two, de two decades went so gpus came in high memory became easy and more uh, you know uh, to procure and so on and so forth and today you can give uh, you know an uh, a, a neural network architecture raw text and you can get you know outputs right away. You're not doing feature engineering anymore. So somewhere in 20, late 2020, early 2021, we started thinking about uh, what was driving this AI revolution. And really, there were two key insights. One is that you know, you're, what these neural networks are learning are you know, optimal embeddings. And you're still learning those relationships that we were trying to encode. And the big a uh, revolution was in transfer learning, and you were getting a lot more higher model accuracy. But when my co-founders and I met, and I was at LinkedIn, one of them was at Pinterest and one at Airbnb, we said, we were not seeing that in our companies, in our feed ranking systems, in our uh, notification ranking system. Our production ML systems looked something like this. Cobbled together several, several systems, data transformations, you're taking a data warehouse, you're flattening it, you're getting to a feature store, you're, uh, uh, and without going into the, you know, the, the number of logos or the number of tools in there, it felt like we were doing a question answering in 2003. So we asked ourselves the question as to why isn't the deep learning revolution hitting the enterprise in the way that it was hitting certain classes of problems, text and uh, images, right? And text and images are really sequences and grids. And we've gotten really good at building neural network architectures for sequences and grids. But your data in your enterprise is deeply relational. So whether you're an e-commerce site, like whether you have orders and customers, or you have uh, you know, financial data, or you have social networks. And social network was what I was working on, what my, my co-founder who's at Pinterest was working on. That's the most deeply relational data. The, the best we could get with deep learning was there was a column that was text, that was the user profile. We would stick it into uh, you know, XG boost, I see lots of nods in your head, <laughs> in the audience, and that's how we were getting to using the latest in the technology. But it wasn't the same 
that was happening to you know text and images. So there was feature engineering happening through domain knowledge. We were com combining features in very complex workflows, and some many of these workflows actually had to do very complex point in time correctness, right? Like so, if you're going to predict whether a user is going to click on an ad or not, you actually had to go comb your uh, logs, you had to split it by time, you had to make sure that the features were point in time correct for train and test, and that was where the kitchen sink that we showed earlier came in. And what was happening is that was an on-call engineer's nightmare. I know there are some people from my old team here, but we've spent a lot of time, <laughs> you know, on, in on-call trying to debug those kind of workflows. And so we asked ourselves, what if asking a predictive question on your warehouse was as simple as uh, querying the past? So SQL made it so easy to say which users gonna, you know, click which users clicked on my ads last week. Can we make it so easy, as easy as SQL to ask the question which users are gonna click my on my ads next week? And can we make it as easy as the chat GPT interface? So we started envisioning an AI system that uh, looks something like this. This plain text, we're still not there yet with uh, you know, a text interface, but we started saying, hey, you should be able to specify your problem specification as, easy, as easily as this. So if you want to predict the lifetime value of a user in the next 60 days, it should just be like an Excel macro function or like SQL or something like that. And you shouldn't have to think about how to construct your trading table in this complex way. And then, so we asked ourselves, can we actually define a neural network framework that can look at your warehouse, that can look at the tables, the columns, the rows, and these relationships at the fundamental, at the raw level, table level, without having to do those complex joints that we do to flatten the warehouse? Can we learn an architecture? and? You know, can we just eliminate feature engineering? And if you could do that, just like ChatGPT is bringing you that, uh, the huge productivity gains, we could potentially bring the data, uh, that kind of productivity gains for a data scientist. Because really what a data scientist should be doing is formulating where in the business do I need predictions? Do I need predictions at for notifications, do I need predictions here? They should be able to try many different hypotheses and stick uh, you know, a model into production. We have a little joke, like one of my co-founders is from Airbnb, and he would say that you know, sometimes it takes uh, six months to build the first model, and I don't have the heart to tell the engineer don't ship it, because so much effort went into it. So you should be able to you know, try out models so quickly that you don't feel like you've vested so much time into it that, uh, you know, uh, it isn't a loss to, you know, try something else. So the answer is yes. And the fundamental observation came from work that we were doing at LinkedIn. And there, were, there are folks in the room who, uh, you know, who were pushing the technology here. There was still work happening in, uh, of Pinterest and in academia. And uh, the key is, we, so the three of us, uh, that's me in the middle, there's Yuri Leskovic, who's the, uh, our chief scientist and also uh, the Pinterest, uh, you know, uh, chief scientist from Pinterest who joined Kumo and Vanya uh, Jostjovsky who came in from Airbnb. So the three of us got together, we raised two for rounds of funding. We, uh, you know, talked, to uh, other warehouse uh, owners like Frank Lutman from the Snowflake and uh, you know the Databricks co-founders to so just test our ideas, and that was the birth of Google. So year and a half in, this is what in one in a one two three our interface looks like. You come into Google, you get you know you bring in your data warehouse, uh, you get a catalog of tables, you register your schema, and then you start defining your prediction problems. So no more training table creation, none of that, all of that is taken away. But how do we do that? So the fundamental uh, premise here is your enterprise is a graph. 
Now, people don't think of that as graph. Like when I was in PYMK, it was very easy to see your data as a graph. But even within LinkedIn, sometimes, you know, different teams didn't necessarily see their clicks and views and all of those entities connecting together as a graph. But all of that is. So, you know, your user and your product can be nodes in a graph and your views and sessions and sales are all edges. And that's the fundamental, uh, you know, one fundamental piece in Como's technology where we say, give us your warehouse and we'll convert it into a graph. The second one was the graph neural networks are an extremely powerful way to actually build neural network technology, which is much more general than the CNNs and the RNNs. So this is just a visualization to, you know, to, to think about how the architectures are being created. But if you have a target node and, you know, that's the, the lady there and, uh, you know, you're making a prediction whether she's going to click on something or not, there's a neighborhood around the, you know, the individual, there, there are connections, there are products that have been clicked on and so on. And your neighborhood organically gives you a neural network. You can bring in your own features, you can bring in your text features, you can bring in your image features through the LLMs and the, the generated models. And those are your in, initial embedding vectors that come in, but you can actually enhance and learn over those relationships on the graph. So graph neural networks have this ad adaptability to complex data input, and they can capture local and global patterns. And we were, we were able to, we have a, you know, a, uh, several customers were able to actually combine click streams, event logs. We have customers with large amounts of text in some of their columns and so on and so forth. And we're pretty confident in our hypothesis one and a half years into the company. Uh, again, this is a slide to just say how flexible and expressive these models are. You can go into the literature for the GNN formulation is a slight modification of the CNN formulation. And it's easy to see why a generic graph formulation would subsume a uh, you know, CNN formulation. Uh, at, uh, so uh, the founding team of Como also was the founding team of an open source library called PyTorch Geometric. PyG is the state of the art in graph learning. Uh, we own, we maintain it, and that's the one place where all of the academic uh, contributions happen. So the latest and greatest in, in GNN architectures are out there. A lot of people put their, you know, the latest architectures from their papers out there. It's supported by Stanford, DU Dorbrin, Kumo, and even Intel and NVIDIA are actually building accelerators for uh, PyTorch. But in general, PyG itself on its own doesn't scale and graph neural networks, you know, for those of you in the field, you think of graphs and you think they're inherently hard to scale. And that's what Como's done in its paid product. We made, so PyG brings you to a certain degree of scale, but the Como architecture actually lets you scale. Today, our, our biggest customer is at 25 terabytes in terms of data set size, and we're doing 40 billion edges and we're able to do predictions on that. Um, we, uh, we have a predictive query engine, and that's the one that completely masks away. It takes your predictive query, creates training tables, and we completely abstract away all of that from the user. So a um, lot of uh, you know, academic work happening on graph neural networks, a lot of uh, impact in different companies that are being seen. But oftentimes, many of these companies have uh, a lot of resources in terms of people who understand the tech and people who uh, have the compute horsepower. Uh, Como aims to make it cheap and more accessible to a broader set of data scientists to use for their work. So in closing, uh, your data is a graph. So you may not think about it. But if your data is relational and richly relational, you really have a graph. Um, if you're interested in graph neural networks, uh, uh, you can contribute to PyG. If you're interested in using graph neural networks or the power of graph neural networks for your business, uh, ping us at Kumo. And uh, here are a few links. We also, if you want to go deeper 
We do a monthly or so webinar series. We go deeper into our architecture, our technology, and so on. Feel free to, you know, uh, go deeper. This is just meant to be a pointer. Right? Huh? Um, that was very interesting to uh, teach the ideas of Spark. Can you guys hear me though? Okay. Uh, please feel free to come to the center of the room where we have a mic installed so you can ask your questions from there. Okay. Hi, Hema. Sorry, I joined late and maybe already addressed this, but wanted to know like sort of the scale at which Kubo operates. So, what is the kind of like how large database have you ingested and what, 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 what are the size of the typical graph of them? So uh, we see a variety of customers. Uh, we, uh, I think, our largest customer now has a data warehouse uh, of twenty-five terabytes. I mean, and we don't import the entire data warehouse. We actually just import the the sets of tables that are relevant for a, a problem. But once people start bringing in click streams and view data, it becomes pretty big. So twenty-five terabytes with forty billion nodes is the largest we've seen. We're able to scale. So uh, just going a little deeper. Uh, and one of the things of being a startup. So when I was at LinkedIn, you would just stuff your graph into memory because we just had so really high, beefy, you know, high memory machines. When you go to the public cloud, you don't have that. So we were just forced to innovate and actually horizontally scale um, how we build our graph. So the only thing we store in memory are the edges, and that's the only vertical scaling component for us. Otherwise, everything else is horizontal scaling. It may just take a long time to run your trading, but for, for that, for the large part, um, we, we, can, we can horizontally scale. Thank you, um, Great presentation. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, knowing that you know, text and images, those itself are a big deal, and it's really complicated to get deep down uh, in the main network type of text. Do you see speech coming into uh, the picture, or if it's already in picture, what are your thoughts and how do you envision speech and audio yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, speech is captured by, should be captured by the generative uh, AI landscape already. And I'll let I'll actually leave that question for you to answer because you're the expert on the on the generative side. But uh, I think speech actually took off with the same uh, with the same momentum when uh, you know language modeling and so on. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Bindi. Thanks for giving such a great presentation today. And uh, I have two questions. The first one is about the uh, input data structure. So uh, would you take only like structured data or unstru uh, unstructured data or any format you can convert to your the format you need or you have to let customer provide some specific format of data? The second question is you mentioned you can Akuma can help uh, users to save money on uh, training uh, generate modules. Uh, could you uh, could you introduce a little bit about how how uh, Kumo save money on this part compared with the company? They train their own module and customize their own models. Thank so, you. So uh, great questions, by the way. So the first is, uh, uh, you know, in terms of input data formats, uh, where so you can bring in a data warehouse, you can bring in 4K files. Kumo does better when your data is deeply relational. So if you're bringing in one table, you might as well use X tables, just like where I would tell, if you were my customer, I would say all you have is one table, one one. but a column can be in a deeply relational database can be semi-structured or unstructured, it could be a blob. We can handle all of that. But what you want is a, you know, a database with deeply relational structure. So that 
and we can take many different formats. We, right now, a lot of our customers are on Snowflake, Redshift, or part, just give us Parquet files on S3, but all of that works. Um, the second question was, how does Kumo save costs? I think you saw that big workflow, that the big uh, complex diagram that I had earlier. So building an AI model for most companies, unless they are larger and have done major AI productivity investments, is still three to six months. Because you build a model, you try to, you know, clone those online features to offline and so on and so forth. So what you do, by cutting short the time to market for a model, you're actually saving cost. So that's... Thank you for the session. Uh, one, so one question I had you already answered previously. Second question that comes to my mind is, is it a requirement that we would, um, that this product would only take in relational data sets or it could be like a flat structure and it would build the relation itself? How, how does that part work? So um, we can build relations, right? Like, so because if, if you think of, um, Determining whether a user will click on an item at a graph level, that is actually doing a link prediction problem. So Kumos actually does node prediction, node regression, uh, link prediction. You know, we do a whole class of problems. But that said, if your data set that you're initially coming with is just one table to the you know previous point, I would say maybe another technique is perhaps better, but most enterprises are not at a one table state. Everyone is in a multi-table state. So hey, folks, um, uh, Hema and the rest of the speakers will be around for networking and uh, you can go and talk to them later about your questions. Um, for now, we'll move on. Um, I'd like to invite onto the stage Shavi Amatrian. He is the VP for product and AI strategy at LinkedIn. And he's going to talk about the journey of generative AI and how we plan to leverage it at LinkedIn. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be. Oh, I have a clicker. Awesome. It's great to be here. Uh, interestingly, it's not the first talk that I give uh, at a women's conference. I get called often. Uh, and I, I got to think about it this way. Uh, people don't know this, but I grew up most of my childhood and my teenage years with only women in my house. And then after that, I've managed a lot of women, some of whom are in the audience. And I've also been managed by women several times, which is not common in tech. So I guess there's something that, uh, you know, I uh, connect very well with all of you and super excited to be here and to talk to you about a little bit the journey from the past to the future and where we are and talk about generative AI and how it's changing the world. So with that, a little bit about myself. I've been at LinkedIn for only six months. And as you can tell from the color of my beard, I've been around for much longer than that. And I started in research after my PhD and went to industry at Netflix where I started and led the machine learning algorithms team. Anyone from Netflix here in the audience? Yeah, one person from Netflix, awesome. Then I went to Quora, uh, where I led the engineering team. Anyone from Quora? No. And then I started and co-founded Curi Health, uh, which is a AI healthcare company. And I know there is Anitha from Curi over there. You should talk to her. She's not the new head of, uh, uh, not the new, the head of AI and machine learning at Curi Health. And uh, six months ago, I came to LinkedIn to lead projects around generative AI. So let's start with the past. And I um, like to start with the Netflix prize because that's when I became very passionate about trying to use data to understand humans and to do something with it in order to have impact. So I don't know how many people here in the audience remember, but 2006, Netflix had a $1 million contest. All you needed to do is improve their algorithm by 10% in root mean square error. And I say all you have to do, but it took three years and thousands of people around the world to actually improve 
that 10%. And at that time, I was not on Netflix, but I went right at the time when it was going to be productionized. Now, the algorithm, some, the final prize had 114 different methods in an ensemble, and only two of them were productionized. But even with that, uh, we realized at that time when we were putting this into product that the gains that we saw offline did not map into gains in the product. In fact, we were asking the wrong question. Predicting the rating did not map into users liking something more or even consuming more. So why is that? So let me walk you through like how um, you know to think about going from rating prediction to more complex multidimensional machine learning models. If you think about two different features, predicted rating and popularity, right? Uh, you can think about how those two features affect whether a user is going to like something or not. You might argue for some people, popularity might be more important. And even for some items, for some movies, it's going to be more important. For some others, it's going to be the rating. So what do you do? The easiest thing you can do, and this is where we start, linear models, is to just basically combine the two features in a linear model and say, there's going to be a weight that I need to estimate given the data that I have. And that produces a, a line. That's why it's a linear model. And I project the uh, items into that linear model, and I get a ranking. This is uh, you know, personalized ranking 101. It's very simple. It actually works pretty well as a baseline and just has two features and a linear model. But this is where we got started. This is the past. Now, this is real numbers that I presented when I was in Netflix from saying, OK, yeah, popularity plus ratings gets you uh, only about 30% improvement over the baseline, which is popularity. And if you add more features, and instead of a linear model, you might add some nonlinearities, then you get over 200% in improvement uh, using the business metric here to measure what was the improvement. So the first journey that we saw over those years was from rating prediction to ranking to page optimization, because a page has more than two dimensions. There's not only a single ranking. And finally, we also work on context-aware recommendations. It's not only about the page. It's about the device, the time of the day, um, the day of the week, things that might affect what you might want to uh, watch or what you want, one might want to consume, depending on where you are. So that's kind of like the first journey. And then came deep learning, right? And it transformed everything. So about 10 years ago, everyone started saying, oh, wait, wait, wait. But uh, I mean, all these models can actually be now done with some kind of deep learning. And particularly the wide and deep learning models, which means you can have wide models that take care of the feature engineering and incorporate those features into the model. And then the deep layers that learn representations that are more complex, like embeddings and so on. And you can combine those in many different ways. And you can see it here a few papers of different companies using deep learning for recommendations from uh, YouTube to Airbnb. So that's all past. Now let's talk about the present past. Sorry, the transition from present to past. So deep learning uh, and deep and wide networks led very soon to this realization that embeddings are really key for recommendations, search, anything that requires a lower dimensional representation of either your content, your users, the interaction between content and users. And embeddings is, when I, when I talk about past, present, I mean, it started a few years ago, but they are being used in industry for everything. And we obviously use them here at LinkedIn, but it's sort of like the bread and butter of how to represent a highly complex. In fact, um, you can use graph neural networks, as uh, Hema was saying, to get embeddings from a graph and represent it in a, a compact space. And uh, graphs, uh, in fact, graph neural networks are being used. Um, there's one article there about uh, Amazon using graph neural networks for related products. This is from only two months ago. So graphs 
plus embeddings plus deep neural networks. It's kind of like the present of what's being used uh, by most companies in production at scale. But now we're transitioning to the future, right? So what's next? And of course, that's generative AI, right? So we're transitioning from a world of linear to deep learning, embeddings, graphs to generative AI. And I'm sure you've all been, uh, I mean, how many of you use ChatGPT daily? Quite a few, right? It's become our uh, newest friend. In fact, the meeting just previous to this, I was, uh, there was a woman in, in, the, in the room talking about how her 16-year-old girlfriend had broken up with her boyfriend because he had used ChatGPT to write an apology letter. It's like, oh my gosh, what a fault class. Okay, so how does this fit into the history of what I've been mentioning and generally in the history of AI, right? If you go all the way back, 1958, uh, the term artificial intelligence is coined, and then there's a bunch of AI winters, right? And we came out of the last AI winter around 2011 with Google finding Cat using deep learning. And we were like, okay, that's a nice application, but it's, you know, not, it, it's not going to solve anything in the world. But then we did see deep learning, learning to play chess, learning to play Go, learning to play Atari, and getting fancier and fancier. And then all of a sudden, in 2018, Transformers and GPT and BERT came out, right? 2018, that's five years ago, right? Crazy how much things have changed in only five years. Um, in fact, this is a zoom in on what has happened over the last five years from 2018 at uh, GPT and BERT all the way to, I don't think I have GPT-4 in this one, but I'm, I'm changing it as we speak. This is a catalog of transformers that I maintain, and we'll actually use it um, in different places in this uh, slide deck. But you can see how models have continued to grow exponentially and also in size, right? Uh, from just 100 million parameters to billions and trillions of parameters. And this is just exploding. Again, I, I have to repeat it to myself because it's only in five years, right? And literally every week, there's new models and new innovations that I can barely keep up. So I don't know that any, everyone here is an expert on generative AI, but I'm just going to give a very quick primer, right? If you have to remember what is generative AI, you think about the acronym GPT, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Those are the three keywords, right? Generative basically means it can generate content out of an input, a prompt, some natural language that you input to the model. Pre-train means that has been pre-trained on all or a lot of data, like basically the whole of the internet and books and whatnot. And therefore, it already has knowledge that is embedded in the model and can do zero shot learning, which means it can learn on the fly. You can actually input some new learning as you input the prompt and it learns from that. And finally, the concept of transformer, which is just a different kind of deep learning architecture. You have an encoder, a decoder, an encoder, and you have attention, which is the key aspect of transformers. So zooming into GPT, um, as I mentioned, GPT came out in 2018. And GPT-3, I'm just skipping over to GPT-3 because GPT-2 uh, was not uh, popular at all. But GPT-3, 2020, GPT-3.5 um, was a ver variation of GPT-3, including instruction, uh, instruct GPT tricks, and then chat GPT. All of that in the context of three years, right? So uh, this is sort of like, Again, the pace of innovation uh, increasing and going faster and faster. And now, of course, we have text-to-image, text-to-video. Uh, we have action transformers using reinforcement learning and learning about actions. So the space is uh, growing uh, very rapidly. 
prompt engineering is the new uh, sort of skill to add to your LinkedIn profile. In fact, we added it to LinkedIn very recently. Now you can add it. And there's a course online on LinkedIn that I published this week on Monday. So I encourage you to take it. Uh, but the notion of prompt engineering is how do you talk to an AI, right? You use natural language and you have to talk to it. And there are tricks, there's uh, tips. You can use uh, things like chain of thought in which you basically coach the uh, language model into how to think and how to respond. So all of that has become a new trend and a very useful one. There's literally many companies now around uh, the world hiring prompt engineers. So that's something that uh, I would encourage people to look into. And in fact, uh, sorry, just um, a word here on prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is not only for engineers. In fact, there's people that have domain expertise that really are very valuable in building prompts. And for example, at Cura Health, we had doctors, medical doctors, working with Anitha on building prompts for how to sort of like inject that into the AI and get the right result. So I'm, I think prompt engineering is going to be a basic skill for everyone. And uh, I'm sure the 16-year-old who got dropped by his girlfriend would have benefited from a little bit of prompt engineering because it, it was very obvious that it was not him. Um, so going back to recommendations, which I've been talking about uh, from the beginning, here's an example of using a prompt to get recommendations. Right? This is very basic. Uh, I'm inputting some Netflix shows, which I like, and I tell GPT to give me some recommendations, which are actually pretty good. And then I can talk about the recommendations. I can talk, ask for more explanations and say, can you tell me more about these two shows because I haven't watched them? And it will go into telling me more about those shows. But this is a very basic. You can do more fancy stuff. For example, you can ask it to, hey, ask me questions. You don't know anything about me. Ask me questions. And when you think you know enough about me, then recommend me music. And this is me just answering yes or no questions with uh, GPT-4. And then at the end, getting some recommendations from bands that I actually like. If you think about it, this is a very fancy application because I haven't told anything to GPT. I'm just asking it to uh, get information from me and then make me a recommendation. Uh, here's another example. Here I'm actually asking to recommend more than just um, items. I'm saying, hey, I have a dinner. I have friends coming in. There's vegetarian people. There's non-vegetarian people. I need to cook. I don't even know what to cook and what to buy, what ingredients to buy to cook whatever. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so it will recommend me uh, the dishes that I need to cook and the ingredients that I need. In order. So if you think about it, this is a new paradigm for everything, including the recommendations that we started with grading prediction to linear models to deep learning. And now we're like, oh, this can be generated by generative AI, right? Um, my uh, message here is like everything will get disrupted by AI uh, very quickly. I mean, the pace of innovation is crazy. We're seeing things like Auto GPT. I don't know if people have heard about it. It was it's just an open source project that came out three weeks ago, and it's, it has more GitHub stars than PyTorch right now. And now there's a new one, Agent GPT, which came out last week. And uh, from what we've tried internally is actually better than Auto GPT. And this uh, sort of like innovation base is getting crazy and keeping up is uh, a full-time job. So I would encourage everyone, wherever you are, whatever uh, job you have, whatever uh, company you work at, just think about how this is going to transform or revolutionize even your daily job. I'm sure many of you that raise your hand saying you use ChatGPT every day, it is because you use it for whatever you're doing. I mean, even coding, right? So it, it will code for you or help you code or do a SQL query or whatever you need to do on your day to day. Um, of course, there's problems, right? There's hallucination. Uh, there's large language models don't really have a sense of truth. They will just make up stuff to try to convince you. And uh, they can be jailbreak. They can also have good and bad knowledge. 
they're also very large and sometimes expensive, like GPT-4 is very large and expensive. Uh, there's others that are smaller. Um, and they're also, they're very general purpose, but they might not be specific to what you need. So you need to really either fine tune them or be very good about prompt engineering to get them to work to your specific case. Um, at LinkedIn, we have been preparing for this for a long time. This is Tomer, one of my two bosses. He's the head of product here. And he said, generative AI will take our innovation to new levels, becoming the most transformational technology we have ever experienced. This sound like big words, but we are really thinking about generative AI as big as the internet or mobile or some of these revolutions that happen once every 10 years at most. And this might be bigger. Um, we have three pro uh, products, generative AI products, already in production. We have collaborative articles. Here we're doing something really interesting. We're using generative AI prompt, which are articles, to prompt users to contribute on those articles. So we're actually getting human content using the AI content as a prompt. Uh, we have a feature that can enhance your profile. And if you click on it, it will help you create a better summary and a better headline and tell you what sections you're missing if you're, for example, trying to look for a job. And also we have an AI-generated job descriptor. That's for recruiters when they're putting up uh, uh, a job description. We help them sort of like uh, not only tune it, but also make it not, not biased and, and uh, really on point and uh, putting everything in the prompt that we know on how to build and how to create a good job description. Now we have over a hundred different projects that we're tracking over our different marketplaces internally using generative AI. So that's how fast we're moving and how many things we're doing internally. And we're also building tools. So we have tools for easier prompting. We have tools for effective models that include access to the Azure OpenAI models as well as internal ones. We also have a very strong focus on responsible AI and responsible evaluation. So those are the three pillars that we're using for everything that we build internally. This is just a screenshot of our playground. We have an internal playground that is similar to the OpenAI playground, but enables you to access internal LinkedIn data seamlessly, and it's secure and whatnot. So this is what people and teams internally um, use. Our responsible AI principles, we published them maybe four weeks ago. Advance economic opportunity, uphold trust, promote fairness and inclusion, provide transparency, and embrace accountability. This is published on our blog post, and I encourage you to go and read it. This is really important and something that we keep in all our AI, particularly with all the new challenges that generative AI is posing right now. Uh, we have learning courses, we have communication initiatives, lunch and learn sessions, and until June 15th, there's 100 unlocked AI courses on LinkedIn Learning that you can go and use for free. So even if you're not a LinkedIn Learning user, go in there. You have 100 courses that you can use and improve and then put on your profile, um, including um, some by Tomer, our chief product officer. Um, now I'm going to finish this presentation. I, I wanted to have sort of like a women angle to it. So what I did is I went through my catalog, uh, my Transformers Models uh, catalog, which has dozens of, um, of different Transformer models. And I went and looked at all the women that had authored some of these models. Because I think, uh, it, obviously, this, this revolution doesn't happen on its own. And it's a compounding of many different researchers and many different people that have worked on it. And I think, for example, Nikki, she was an author of the first Transformer paper, right? So uh, that's why I put her first. And I have dozens of women here, all of whom have authored some of these models. And uh, I just want to thank them all for doing this work, because this is obviously foundational work that has enabled everything that is happening now and all the possibilities that generative AI um, it, 
is offering to us right now. I uh, don't know if any of them is in the room, but oops, if they are, uh, thank you, even if they're not. And obviously thank all of you, because I'm sure uh, even if you've not contributed directly, you've uh, contributed in some way. Thank you, Shavi. Uh, that was a very insightful talk, and we can't wait to see how generative AI accelerates link LinkedIn's vision to generate equal economic opportunity for every member of the workforce. Uh, but before you leave the stage, we'll open up for questions. So folks, if you have any questions, please come to the mic. on it in the last slide, but I wanted to know more. How are you going to balance between the ethics, developing responsibly, bias, and all that, and uh, how the field is growing, fail fast, iterate faster? How are you going to balance the two? It, it's a great question. I mean, um, first of all, we, um, we put the principles out, and that drives all the decisions we make on what are the risks that we're willing to take and which ones we're not. But secondly, and very important, we have a dedicated internal team working on responsible AI. That includes people that are AI experts, includes uh, legal folks, includes people from policy, uh, from all walks of life and different teams. And that's a horizontal team that is working on uh, responsible AI, and specifically, actually, I don't know that Grace is in the room. Grace Tang, not in the room. She's our representative for all the responsible AI, generative AI uh, products and projects that are happening. And uh, we basically um, have sort of like this internal team that is sort of like overseeing and acting as a consulting uh, for all these projects that are happening. But I agree, there's a lot of unknowns, right? We're in that sense, we're pretty lucky that we have a constrained use case and application, and we're not just launching an open world chatbot and hoping that it works. We are building solutions for our product, as you saw, and we take into account like every possibility to avoid biases and avoid hallucination and avoid bad, bad outcomes. Since, thanks for the talk, firstly. I saw you have one slide talk about the LinkedIn product currently using generative AI, like a collaborative uh, article, like an uh, enhanced profile, right? Mostly, I can see that uh, enhancement or collaborative article based on the text. Have, have you considered about using the, uh, like a image generation, like a uh, if you use a model or whatever game uh, to generate images uh, to enhance the product or enhance some customer, uh, um, is there, um, they didn't talk about too much about image, that's because some limitation uh, of the yep. image generation or? No, no. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to yeah, ask. Great, great question. The reason I have not talked about image is because uh, there's not much of the public thing to be published that has image generation. However, the collaborative articles that I mentioned do have an image that is attached to every article, which is generated by generative AI. So those actually do have image generation. It's pretty basic because it's just an image that accompanies uh, an article. But we are doing a project of the 100 and more projects that we're doing internally. There are some that are doing text to image. And also, we are exploring all other kinds of multimodality, including voice, which was mentioned before in one of the questions to Hema. And uh, I'm really bullish on action transformers, too, as a way to predict actions and so on. So I think we're starting with text plus images because that can get you uh, a lot of the uh, can get, get you to even very complex um, use cases, but multimodality is definitely the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for your presentation, and I appreciate your efforts of uh, connecting the context to the, all the women audience here. 
And uh, yeah, my specific question is related with uh, when you mentioned LinkedIn already has a playground that allows uh, your employees to access, uh, to use like generative, generative AI to with like the LinkedIn data. So I'm wondering whether you can share some procedure of uh, uh, getting to be able to use the, the customer data um, with generative AI. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think everyone who is playing around with generative AI and ChatGPT has this question of like, okay, that's nice, but how do I input my data if I'm in a company and how I, do I keep it private and secure and all of that? And even how do I do it, right? So th there's um, there's a lot of ways that you can input your data into um, uh, GPT-4 or GPT-3 model, the easiest way is through the prompt, right? So basically, you can do things like retrieval augmented generation. It's called RAG, RAC. Um, you can query a database. You can extract the results of the database, inject them into the prompt, and then send the prompt to GPT, right? That's the easiest way, and it's something that uh, a lot of people are doing. Our playground and something else that we have uh, developed internally, which is a gateway, enables you to do that. The playground is very manual. You can actually import profiles and job descriptions, anything from our internal graph and databases into the prompt and then send it to GPT in a secure way and get results. Uh, but of course, once you have to do that in production, you need to put it into a programmatic form. You don't want to do it manually. But the bottom line, it's uh, you do it the same way, right? You basically get information, get data, put it into the prompt, and then inject that into the prompt that you're sending to GPT. There are more involved methods, like you can fine tune the model with your data. We do that in some cases. And in fact, we even pre train our own internal models with internal data if it's worth it. But in most cases, injecting data in this retrieval augmented generation model is good enough and it has really good results. We have time for more? Um, yeah, I think we're running out of time, folks, but uh, feel free to save your questions for the end. Uh, you can still network with Xavi and ask him your questions in person. Thank, Thank you, Xavi. All right, moving on. Um, next, we move on to our... Can you guys hear me? Uh, next, we move on to our exciting line of um, lightning talks. Through these talks, uh, we will learn how big data and ML AI help realize LinkedIn's vision to create equal economic opportunity for every member of the workforce. Specifically, we will have the opportunity to examine LinkedIn's big data and ML AI flywheel in, um, at, up close. Um, so specifically, we'll be talking about four different topics. Uh, first theme is enabling big data processing at LinkedIn, where we will get an overview of Goblin infrastructure and how we revamped it to improve big data movement at LinkedIn. Next, we will get an overview of one of the infrastructures powering big data at LinkedIn, which is Oklahoma, a managed airflow service. Then we will hear about our plans to increase member engagement on LinkedIn through machine learning and big data solutions using a unique technique uh, called embedded retrieval in LinkedIn's out-of-network feed. The final piece to our flywheel puzzle is generating revenue using big data and ML AI technologies. For this, we use a model revenue engagement trade-off to maximize user engagement and revenue on our site. The revenue flows back to help us invest in the infrastructure to power our big data and ML AI activities at LinkedIn and thus completes our flywheel. In short, by enabling big data processing, investing in infrastructure to support big data and ML activities at LinkedIn, we can succeed in our attempts to increase member engagement on the site and in parallel, generate revenue that continuously helps us grow and invest in our big data and machine learning infrastructure. And here's our lineup of fantastic speakers. Uh, we have Urmi Mustafi, uh, Janki Hakani, uh, Amber Song. Um, unfortunately, Ruby too uh, wasn't able to make it today. Um, she um, had an unforeseen illness, uh, but we'll continue the 
the rest of the presentations as planned. And you can save your questions for the end, and we'll take all of the questions together once the presentations are complete. With that, I now invite Umi over to the stage. Hi, everyone. I want to start you off with some introduction to the big data movement at LinkedIn. We move over 400 terabytes of data on a daily basis using our big data movement service. To put this in some context, that's equivalent to the amount of data used to stream 22 continuous years of Netflix content. And I thought I was watching a lot of TV. Why do we need this data movement? Well, we use this data to exchange information with our business partners. We support our machine learning use cases, conduct analytics, and also serve the most relevant ads to our users. My name is Ormi Mustafi. I'm a weightlifter and a hip hop dancer in my free time. And over the past two years, I've worked on growing LinkedIn's big data movement service. I was initially drawn to this team because I found the scale that LinkedIn operates at super interesting, and I've enjoyed conti continuing to tackle this problem. Over the last few quarters, I've been working on an initiative to improve our service, and I want to take you to through that journey today. The service I've been talking about is Goblin. We call it Goblin as a Service, or GAS, and it was built on the open source Apache project Goblin. It's a self-service tool that's used for cross-cluster data movement. Users can, can configure their copy, retention, or ingestion of data at scale, and they can do so in an ad hoc or a scheduled manner. In fact, we have well over 100,000 jobs running per day on our service. So before I take you through the improvement process, first you have to understand the original GAS architecture as well as some of the problems that it faces. So here I have a diagram that I'm going to walk you through. I know there's a lot of text on the screen. So GAS is represented by the middle three boxes. We have a leader follower model, and the leader is on the left in green, and the two followers are represented by the boxes on the right in red. So in the leader follower model, only the leader is able to accept user requests for data movement. And then only the leader is also able to execute these requests by initiating them on Azkaban. The leader is also the only one to interact with MySQL and store some state information and Kafka to get some updates about, did your job succeed or fail? So this has some limitations, which I'll go into. Another key um, point I want to bring out is if you look at the structure of GAS, inside there's a whole jumble of text. And that's actually meant to represent the monolithic code structure that we had before. So this makes it really hard to reason about the different components that we have and even harder to interact with them separately. So to kind of summarize these, the problems I identified were, one, we have an availability issue. In the leader follower model, the leader um, failover takes three to five minutes. So every time a leader failover occurs, the entire gas structure, the glass cluster, is uh, unavailable. Second we have the reliability issue. In the worst case scenario, our startup time took 40 minutes. That's a long time. And all of our scheduled flows are skipped during that time period. So as the user, they have to do some work around like over schedule their flows, just in case it's skipped for a startup. That's a pretty bad user experience. And then lastly, we're gonna have a scale issue. We can't handle really high request volumes and this is going to bite us in the future. So first, let me take you through how we approach the first problem of availability with a multi-leader model. So we weren't able to get to multi-leader immediately, but we wanted to incrementally get some availability gains. And the first step in doing so is getting rid of that monolithic code structure. So we created three separate layers. We have an API layer, an execution layer, and then a monitoring layer. And doing this allows us to have any of the hosts, not just the leader, accept incoming user requests. So how this happens is the follower, for example, gets some requests from the user in its API layer, 
And then it stores that request information in MySQL. Then that request is conveyed to the leader using a change data capture stream that's communicated using Kafka. And then just like the old model, the leader will initiate that request on Azkaban. So we're able to get some improvement here by having um, other instances also accept requests. But the end state that we want to achieve is multi-leader, like I mentioned. So this will allow us to have all hosts both accept and then also execute user requests. And we laid the foundation for this end state we want to reach with the distinct layers that we made. So in this version, we want um, all of the hosts to accept requests, then store those in MySQL, which we use to coordinate between various instances of gas. Um, and then we introduce something new, which is uh, for the horizontal scaling. We have partitioning with a leader and a warm standby. So the leader is going to only execute requests that are um, in the partition it's a leader for. And then a warm standby is something that just keeps up to date about uh, the new requests and other state information. And then this is in the event of a leader failover, then it can fail over much more quickly than before. So this is how we approach the availability problem. And this is still the uh, something that I'm working on currently. So second, I mentioned a reliability issue. And this was due to the very large uh, initialization time. So I approached this with the following. Um, I had some theories about what I thought this 40 minute, like enormous startup time was due to. Um, but before going on a like wild goose hunt, we did some performance profiling. So first I thought um, maybe MySQL is the limiting factor. We end up getting state from there uh, multiple times. So I took the measurement and it's just half a millisecond. So when I kind of like added this up, this doesn't seem like the major bottleneck for um, this 40 minutes. Then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's all the processing we do on the back end. We do like a bunch of stuff before we're able to execute the job. I measured this and um, though larger, it, it's still not really an issue. It was 100 milliseconds. So it it turns out the uh, actual issue is just the sheer number of jobs we're scheduling. We were scheduling like over five times the number of jobs we thought we were and like actually needed to. So our solution is simple. We just apply a filter and then we only schedule jobs that are needed um, on initialization. And then that ends up giving us a 75% improvement so we're able to drop our initialization time from 40 minutes to 10 minutes. So to recap, we've uh, improved our availability issue by allowing any host to accept requests, not just the leader. We've also made some significant headway to improve our reliability by dropping our startup time from 40 minutes to 10 minutes. We still have a ways to go to get to zero. And then lastly, um, I'm beginning to work on the scaling issue and add horizontal scaling with partitions and a leader standby model. So this is all specific to the gas journey, but I wanna leave you with some more generalizable takeaways. And um, some important lessons I learned on this journey is, it's important to use data-driven solutions before you begin your work. I kind of was on a wild goose hunt before, and um, it was really important to do the performance profiling and make sure I'm in the right direction. And second, the most effective solutions may not be the most technical ones, like applying a filter. But um, it's important to consider these because you sometimes have a, you know, a tight deadline and you want to make sure you're actually achieving results within the time frame that you need to get them done. And then um, lastly, it's important to consider the user perspective. Uh, what does it feel like for a user to interact with their service and use their service? that's ultimately going to be most important. They don't care what's happening behind the scenes. And then um, often overlooked is also the operational cost. We can build like a very fancy solution, but if it's going to be a nightmare to maintain, then um, we haven't actually delivered. So um, thank you for listening to my talk. I uh, hope you understand how uh, pipeline developers use gas to move data at LinkedIn. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Janki. Um, she's going to talk about how uh, 
you actually have pipeline developers manage and execute these pipelines for use cases such as job recommendations or um, people suggestions for like people you can connect, connect with on LinkedIn. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll be covering uh, data pipelines. Uh, what kind of orchestrator do we use? The data that we have moved using Goblin, uh, the pipelines are getting written and orchestrated and scheduled uh, how we manage uh, our architecture, what kind of scale issues are we facing, and the journey uh, within it. So to begin with, uh, my name is Chanki Akhani. Uh, I have been with LinkedIn for seven years. Uh, in my free time, I like to go on a hike or ride a bicycle uh, for my, with my five-year-old daughter. I have been with the data pipelines team for around four years now. Uh, I'll be covering the motivation for this project, uh, followed by deep dive into managed airflow as a service, the architecture, and uh, scale-related information. So uh, let me start with the journey. So at LinkedIn, uh, we open sourced Askaban sometime in 2012. And uh, so this is basically a DAG direct uh, acyclic graph based orchestrator. It's a workflow manager. Uh, users can write their pipelines. It's in form of DAG. They can have multiple nodes and it basically submits a grid compute. So you can submit Spark, Hadoop, various kind of jobs in your uh, grid basically. So we had this tool open sourced with time the scale increased at LinkedIn, we started facing challenges in our architecture. One of the basic challenges that we were facing is, uh, in Azkaban, we have web server, executor, and MySQL database. Uh, web server is a single uh, application, single host, stateful application. We cannot have high availability for this component. So with time, as in, uh, the scale uh, increased around 2020, uh, whenever any scale increase on any particular cluster, we launch another cluster and divert some of the load over there. By doing that, we ended up having 20 clusters. So maintaining 20 clusters, toil of it, uh, releasing any new uh, version on any of these clusters was taking two to three weeks of time. Uh, actually, in last uh, from 2017 to 22, uh, the scale has increased 10x time on Askiban. And number of executions that we have on Askiban on all of these clusters is uh, more than 170,000 per day. So these are the challenges that we were facing every day on Askiban. And the toil, the operational cost was increasing uh, also uh, a lot uh, on this orchestrator. So that was the time uh, around in 2021 when we thought, what should we do now? Shall we invest time in building Askiban 2.0? Or shall we see what is open source community doing? So in case of Askaban, the pipeline uh, DSL for it is basically YAML-based DSL. And we saw that open source community is more uh, preferring Python. Data scientists, ML engineers, all of them, they prefer Python-based DSL. So we investigated what is the most uh, heavily used open source orchestrator, and we found Apache Airflow. It's, uh, it has a very large open source community. It's a Python-based uh, DAG definition. Uh, so, and it has uh, native support for data triggers. So one of the issues uh, that we saw in Eskiban was people were able to schedule their pipelines, but what they actually need to meet the SLA is data triggers. Whenever my data arrives, schedule my pipeline so that they do not need to address uh, in many of the cases, they have pipelines in a way they schedule that. Let me schedule three hours before the pipeline actually should be executed because I don't know when my data will be arrived. So all of these issues we were seeing and in Apache Airflow, we saw uh, native support for data triggers where you can design your own triggers. It's very extensible architecture. So you can have your own data triggers, event-based triggers, API-based triggers. So because of we had many pipelines where we had all of these use cases. So we, uh, we saw all the benefits and uh, we started thinking about how much effort it will take to actually bring it in LinkedIn and integrate it with LinkedIn ecosystem. So after spending time on MVP, uh, we had successful MVP there and we 
met various companies who are actually using Airflow. Uh, we started understanding what kind of scale limitations it has and uh, what it takes to bring it in LinkedIn. We came up with initiative. Uh, the name of the initiative is Oklahoma. Uh, many people has asked me, is it uh, from the Oklahoma City? Uh, no, this name was uh, uh, from the Oklahoma musical band. It was there sometime in 1943. So the name is inspired from the musical band. So this initiative is about uh, building and operating uh, managed airflow clusters uh, for offline and online data pipelines. Uh, it's a, this initiative has uh, uh, the agenda of providing toll-free airflow cluster creation and maintenance to save the time that we are putting right now in maintaining uh, 20 plus clusters in Iskiban. Data and event-based triggers, uh, self-healing pipelines from intermittent issues. Many times what happens is uh, data pipelines are there, there are some infrastructure issues, some intermittent issues, and then all the pipeline developers have to sit and uh, re-trigger their pipelines due to all of these infrastructure issues. So we want to provide self-healing for all of these issues. Visibility into data lineage. Uh, many times uh, people have their pipeline. They do not know uh, what is the actual data lineage of their pipeline if some input is corrupt. What are the other pipelines which needs to be triggered, the cascading backfill that needs to be triggered so that you can recover your pipeline. So we want to give data lineage for all of these information. Now, uh, let me take you through architecture. Uh, bringing Airflow to LinkedIn ecosystem required us to integrate it with various uh, systems that we have. Uh, one of that is Great Compute to submit Spark, Hadoop, Trino types of jobs through Airflow. Uh, we have implemented execution as a service. Like I was saying, Airflow has very extensible uh, framework, Python-based framework. So we have uh, implemented execution as a service and operator for the same so that we can submit great compute. Uh, we can submit various other kinds of jobs as well, like Kafka, Pino, any uh, Python-based uh, workflow that you want to trigger. Anything you can do uh, with various kind of open source operators or in-house built operators that we have. Uh, in this architecture, uh, so basically the DAG definition that is uh, published by pipeline developers, the metadata of that is getting stored in MySQL and the actual definition is getting stored in NFS so that all of these components can refer to the DAG definition and execute it basically in order it, in which all the tasks needs to be executed. Uh, we have integrated it with our internal central logging system so that uh, people can analyze the logs, let's say, various pipelines fail due to the same reason. You can understand which are all these pipelines and we can implement self-fill out of it that due to this issue, whichever pipelines are uh, failing, go and re-trigger all of these. So having a central logging system will help us to analyze all of this information. Uh, we are also implementing a lot of uh, internal web-based plugins, which we plan to uh, contribute back to open source. Backfill is uh, one such plugin that we have implemented. So for any pipeline, users can go uh, select the date range for that for which they want to backfill the data, provide runtime configuration, and submit the backfill. Uh, we are all we have also implemented uh, upload plugin where users can. Uh, while writing the pipelines, if they want to quickly test it out before they put it in production, before they commit it, the code, they can quickly go and test it uh, on the test cluster and see whether it is working or not and reiterate over it, basically. Now, the squ uh, scale requirements. Uh, Askeban, uh, the existing orchestrator that we have, I want to give a little bit idea about the scale that it has. And the, when we migrate all the workflows from Askeban to Airflow, we are going to support the scale on Airflow. Uh, average number of workflows which are getting executed, uh, 2,000 plus uh, workflows are get 2,000, uh, 200,000 plus workflows are getting executed right now in various Azkaban clusters. So we will be supporting all of these load on Airflow clusters as well. To do so, we will be federating uh, pipelines over multiple Airflow clusters and give transparent execution environment to users so that they do not need to worry about where my pipeline is getting executed. Okay, this Airflow cluster is not able to handle the load. Now we migrate some of the load to another Airflow cluster. We do not want users to bother about, hey, my, where my pipeline is getting executed. Just execute it and give them results. Uh, the Airflow UI availability, 99.9%, .9 we want to provide. 
Um, with many companies, when we were investigating about airflow, we saw monorepo kind of uh, architecture. So where they have to write all the pipelines within the same repository, and all of these pipelines will appear on airflow clusters. We do not want to do that. We want to provide support for managing your pipelines on your own repository based on your use cases. And per uh, repository, maximum DAG you can write, uh, maximum pipelines you can write uh, around 100. And all of these uh, DAGs from various repository will appear on IP clusters and will get executed. Um, the, in Airflow, all the pipelines that you are writing, the task of it can have various types, and we are going to support 30 plus those uh, task types or operator types by uh, implementing in-house operators for it or bringing uh, operators from open source. Uh, so that was the uh, little bit idea about the scale that we are going to support. And with that, there are some interesting uh, features that we are going to build as a part of our roadmap. Uh, these are plus uh, on top of all the in, uh, things that I was sharing as a part of initiative, everything like self-fill, data triggers, all of these. With that, we have all of uh, the roadmap that I have shared on the slide. We are going to work on uh, these items as well. One of the uh, issue that we are seeing right now while developing the pipeline is iterative testing experience. How can I quickly write a pipeline, test it out, verify data, modify it, test it out, and by the time I'm uh, satisfied with the results, productionize it. So basically, iterative testing experience is a really a challenging uh, thing, and it actually can improvise a lot of productivity for pipeline developers. So we uh, that is one of the items in our roadmap. Second thing is uh, right now uh, I searched a lot. Is there any open sourced uh, streaming operator available for Airflow? There are very less use cases that I found. And in uh, LinkedIn, we are working on operators to submit stream jobs through Airflow uh, to provide a way to orchestrate streaming jobs as well. And uh, last but not the least, we want to migrate all the Askaban uh, workflows to Airflow. And for that, the scale detail that I was sharing, we are uh, doing benchmarking to support that scale. And eventually, uh, we will have a feature parity with Askaban and migrate workflows to Airflow. So yeah, these are the interesting things that I have been working on and I'll be working on uh, in upcoming years. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, next, we have Ember. Uh, she'll be sharing about how we are increasing member engagement uh, through ML and data, big data solutions, which are running on the pipeline orchestrators. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ember. And uh, since Janki talked about how uh, the amazing data pipeline system at LinkedIn, now let's take a look at what can we do with these data pipelines and how does it improve our members' experience on LinkedIn feed. Um, so the talk I will be giving is related to embedding-based retrieval and how we're using it at uh, LinkedIn feed. Um, so a quick introduction of myself. My name is Amber, a senior machine learning engineer at Feed and Discover AI at LinkedIn. Um, my, in my free time, I like to play with plants. I have 100 or maybe under 200 plants at home uh, that I take care of. And uh, yeah, my passion that, the passion that takes me to work every day is to improve the experience that members have with our recommendation systems. Um, so in this talk, we'll first be uh, introducing what is uh, LinkedIn feed and what is out of network LinkedIn feed and the goal of the presentation. Uh, second of all, we will be, in we'll be introducing embedding based retrieval. And then after that, uh, we'll talk about how we're using it in out of network feed. Uh, in the end, we'll be uh, talking about takeaways and future improvements. So before I go into the details about uh, embedding based retrieval, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of the industry classic recommendation system architecture. So normally in a recommendation system, there's a candidate generation stage and a ranking stage. The candidate generation stage um, is in charge of taking in millions or billions of documents or videos and select probably top 100 or 1,000 documents out of them. 
So this this stage needs to be very efficient. Need to deal with a large corpus, and also specialize in trying to get all the candidates that member might be interested in. And then we have the second stage, which is the ranking stage. Um, basically, takes in hundreds or thousands of documents, and then output dozens that members might be interested in the most. So this stage, uh, we can have more complex models and more features, and it can take more time than candidate generation stage. And the goal of this stage is to make sure all the things that we rank on the, at the top are the items that the members might be interested in. Uh, next, let's take a look at what is out-of-network content uh, in LinkedIn feed. So the majority content that members see, uh, you see every day in your feed are from your connections, meaning people that you have connected with or you followed previously. However, this also means you have limited choice when you look at your content and it um, does not give you all the access of all the data we have available at LinkedIn. So with out of network content, we want to serve our members posts or videos or any content type that can be available that can be from people not you are not connected with or you don't follow. So this ensures uh, we have a, di uh, a really diverse feed for our members. Uh, second of all, the reason we want to have the out of network content is because um, it really helps with co star problem. For new members, when they come to LinkedIn, they don't have a lot of connections. So with out of network content, we can ensure even if you don't have any people you follow, you can still be informed at LinkedIn platform. Uh, third of all, it also helps uh, the creators of the content to increase their reach because um, now they can their content can be published or served for members that don't follow them anymore. Um, the goal of this talk, in, at the end, we would like to understand uh, what is embedding this for Trivial and also how are we using it at LinkedIn feed uh, in our out of network. So what is retrieval? First, let's understand that. Retrieval is the process that we take a member query and we select a lot of documents out of a big corpus based on this member query. So there's uh, three main parts. We have a collection of documents, a member, and then out of this two, we select the relevant documents for this member. And why do we want to use embeddings? So embeddings uh, is a form of member or item representation that capture the complexity of language. And it helps to reflect the similarity between content really well. So considering we have a member embedding, which represents the member, and the vector embedding, sorry, a document embedding, which represents the document, we can easily use them to produce a similarity score. And this similarity score can represent how relevant the item is to this member. The embedding-based retrieval process is uh, basically the process I was talking about that finds a relevant document to a member query based on the similarity function. And the goal of embedding this retrieval, or the goal of retrieval itself at the candidate generation stage, as we talked about, is to serve or find relevant documents with really low latency and computational costs. So we have big corpus, and in order to select hundreds of documents out of millions, we need to make sure this computation is really efficient. And that's why we're going to use embedding this retrieval. Uh, these are some of the applications of embedding based retrieval in industry. In social networks, we use it um, to analyze the relationship between members. And in advertising, we can recommend uh, advertisement that's uh, targeted to the specific member. Uh, more importantly, for our case in feed, we can use embeddings to retrieve candidates that are really relevant to them. And then in search, given a member query, we can use embedding to represent it and select documents that are relevant. Um, OK, so based on the above information, let's take a look at why do we want to use embedding-based retrieval in out-of-network 
LinkedIn feed. First of all, embedding, best, uh, embedding help us to get rich information of member based on their interest, and it can be really personalized. Second of all, embedding is really content focused, which means that when we have code start problem, when we don't know that much about the member's connection yet, it can help us still give really relevant recommendations for this member uh, because the embedding information can be mainly focused on text. Uh, fourth, uh, because embedding is really efficient when we have large corpus, it can give us low latency um, serving for big content corpus. And then let's take also take a look at the architecture we have using EBR in out of network feed. So it mainly consists of three components. The first is um, approximate nearest neighbor, which calculates member embedding and item embedding similarity. The second big component is the item embedding. And the third one is member embedding. So looking at the architecture diagram, when member first visit LinkedIn feed, they are going to trigger a ranking stage. This ranking stage is going to blend a lot of different candidates from different content sources. In LinkedIn's um, case, we have in-network candidate source, we have out-of-network candidate source, and other ones, for example, as. Let's focus on the out-of-network candidate source. When the member query come in and triggers this stage, our candidate source service will first trigger a key value store to fetch the member embeddings that we have calculated. And then this member embedding will be sent to a proximate nearest neighbor system to fetch the relevant item embeddings that have really high similarity with the member embedding. And then how do we uh, capture or calculate the member embeddings and item embeddings? It's through a really classic two tower model that we have. On the left side, we have member embedding tower, which captures members' profile features, for example, members' title, industry, skills, and then also capture the past actions member have at LinkedIn. For example, what action, uh, what jobs you applied, uh, which feed you liked. And then on the item tower, we have item features, for example, um, the popularity of this item, how long this item is, and the author features, for example, uh, the industry of the author, uh, how popular the author is. So given this information, we put them in the two-tower model and use similarity function to capture the objective, which is uh, based on the positive interactions members and item had before. Okay, so that was a brief introduction of our out-of-network uh, feed system using embedding-based retrieval. Our future work includes, um, first of all, improving the candidate generation stage. We want to capture members embedding and item embedding faster, which can be done through a nearline manner. And also, we would like to improve our model, uh, improve our model through diversity, personalization, and objectives. After that, we also like to improve how we rank out of network content in the ranking stage. So remember, we have candidate generation stage and ranking stage. Right now, our ranking stage uh, is not super tailored to out-of-network ranking, which is why we want to also incorporate these kind of features to improve how we can rank it after we retrieve the candidates. And then third, uh, we would like to generalize our member embeddings in this project we do to also leverage by other initiatives. Uh, for example, LinkedIn search, or LinkedIn jobs. These are all the projects that we can share embeddings together. Uh, and the key takeaways we want to have from this, uh, first of all, we talk about uh, candidate generation. The goal of this stage is to have focus on recall, have low latency, be able to deal with a large corpus. Second, um, for out of network, the reason we use them is that it gives us diversity in the feed for members, and it can deal with a uh, code start problem really well. Uh, third, uh, the reason we want to have embedding-based retrieval 
is that they can represent member interest, they can focus on the content, they can deal with code star problem, and more importantly, it gives us low latency and can deal with large corpus, which is a really important stage when we deal with a really big uh, corpus of documents, of uh, posts or videos. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Urmi, uh, Janki, and Amber. I actually invite the three uh, speakers back onto the stage um, for Q&A session. And uh, just to remind everyone, our fourth speaker, Ruby Tu, isn't able to make it today because of an unforeseen illness. Uh, but yeah, we'll have the speakers on the stage to take any questions if you have any. I thank you for your presentation. It's very informative. My question is for Janaki. Uh, in the implementation slide, you had uh, presented the um, architecture, how you're using uh, basically like Kubernetes and uh, how you're connecting the, basically instantiating more parts based on the request, right? Um, so could you elaborate a little bit more on how you have used these uh, how have you laid out these microservices in detail so that the load was actually distributed uh, based on the first presentation that uh, uh, was given? Thank you. So uh, currently in uh, Airflow itself, there are various kind of executors that it supports, uh, Celery, Kubernetes. So for all the tasks, uh, we are using Kubernetes, but going forward, we are planning to migrate to Celery Kubernetes so that we can scale up. There are many tasks which are very small running. And if you see in the architecture, there was execution as a service, which was actually responsible for submitting the compute to grid. And actual compute is happening in grid. There is no compute happening in the airflow for many of the tasks where we do not want to waste resources. So we will leverage salary for that. And wherever there is any compute uh, heavy task is needed or any isolation is needed due to security concerns, that's where the Kubernetes uh, worker will be launched. Uh, all the components within Airflow, those are highly available. So we can have various replicas of web server or scheduler within it. Uh, now to manage more load, uh, and if let's say in one Airflow cluster also, there is a scale limitations, even though we have more replicas, that's when we are going to have various Airflow clusters and uh, in future, our plan is to have pipeline as a service so that all these pipelines will be federated to various airflow clusters. So this is how we have divided architecture into multiple microservices. Execution service was one example, but we are going to have reusable services like this uh, for which can be used for various orchest orchestrators. Right now, we had uh, we have Askeban, we are bringing Airflow. In future, that could be any other orchestrator that we bring. We do not want to spend time in integrating with LinkedIn ecosystem going forward. So to do so, uh, self-fill, uh, which is flow resumability, for all of these things, we will create uh, separate microservices to manage uh, this responsibility so that we can reuse it for future purposes. Second question, I will do for you. So one more second question that comes to my mind is you had mentioned a point where you would like the workflow to be designed or and the data to be stored in different databases, right? So um, where is that orchestrator part comes into picture, which actually understands that I have to kind of pick this from this uh, A1, this from A2, and this from A3. And what are the plans to scale that? Because you might need more instances of that to support this kind of uh, uh, functionality. Uh, you're talking about the data that is needed for the pipeline to run or metadata right. of the pipeline itself? The metadata of the pipeline. You mentioned that you're yeah. storing it on different yeah. databases yeah. and then you don't want to restrict it to be yes. stored on one uh, in one repository. Yes. yes. So we do have a storage where complete DAG definition is available. So in there in Airflow, in Scheduler itself, there is a DAG parser, which actually passes this definition and writes it into database. So when we want to federate later on, there could be a storage from where all the Airflow clusters can read and we can divide it in such a way, uh, the storage itself for each Airflow cluster. So parser can read 
from the directory that is dedicated to it and then write it uh, the metadata in the database so that when worker starts he can it can read the metadata and go go forward with the storage path from where it can actually read more information what are the dependencies and anything else so this is how we can federate it later on uh, for various or orchestrator because going forward not e each airflow cluster will have pipeline definition for everything that is that that is going to be managed for all the airflow clusters so we can divide it partition it uh, like this Currently, it's not a part of, uh, it's not a single instance. It's embedded as a part of each of these worker processes that you have, the parcel. Component. Yeah, yeah, parcel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sylvie. Uh, thanks for all uh, the presenters. It was a great presentation. Uh, my question is for Umi. Um, your presentation was really thorough, but looks like the challenges that we are juggling with are mostly around um, the cap theorem, consistency, availability, and partition. Moving forward, is there one of the pillars that you're more focusing on um, and um, that's going to be the highlight for the system? Uh, I guess availability and the scaling problems are probably the ones we're focusing on. We're kind of trying to address all of them, though, I would say. Um, for this quarter, like it's um, finishing the multi-leader, so like having the availability. And also in the future, we want to scale. I kind of showed you like there's three instances, but we want the capabilities to just add instances um, and then remove them as needed. And this can support future like canary deployments and like various other like testing uh, we might want to do. Sounds good. Um, and um, I was also wondering um, the challenges around handling stale data and other hosts. Um, that's a big problem, but any, any ideas of what you're trying to? Um, yeah. Um, so we actually, uh, I guess we're always keeping our data up to date because we every time before we take action, we actually verify with MySQL and get the most up to date data. Um, and then you know we'll do some like checks with like time and uh, timestamp and those sort of things to make sure there's no stillness. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Abhulva. Um, I have a question about Amber. Um, so. Uh, you would have uh, user embeddings and you would have uh, all of your uh, feed embeddings, right? Yep. Um, how do you limit the number of embeddings that you feed into your ranking model? This would become especially challenging if you're doing any part of it online. Right. So the candidate generation stage is used for this, right? We have a lot of candidates and through the candidate generation stage, we can feed millions of documents in our algorithm and our model which outputs hundreds of documents. So that really helps to limit the number that would pass to the ranking stage. But it, and is any of this done in real time? Uh, you mean fetching the documents? Uh, yeah, limiting the documents and then ranking them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This all happens real time. So when member queries come in, we have a pre-computed member embedding. And this embedding will be sent to our approximate neighbor um, framework that be able to fetch, look into all of our documents and fetch handlers at real time. Yeah. And then after this, the handlers will send, be sent to the ranking stage, which also happens at real time, um, that convert them into probably dozens of documents. Thanks. I'm Saida. I have a question from Jointly. Uh, my question is that you, I think based on uh, you presented, you had one self-healing in between the process. I'm wondering how you overcome uh, this challenge as well as like, how do you manage it for different sources, for different, uh, basically different layout that you have in this structure, how the self-healing will be implemented in this case? Uh, so basically what we want to do is we are seeing a lot of issues right now and we want to categorize all these issues. Uh, some could be due to the grid side of issues that let's say yarn side, uh, things are not available, uh, the name node is down, uh, other kind of issues could be artifactory being down. So we want to categorize all of these issues and based on that, this service needs to understand that let's say X number of jobs failed due to this reason and it falls in the category of this, which, which is actually in, could be intermittent issues. So based on history, if it recovers, let's say in 30 minutes, uh, we have some services which recovers in 30 minutes. 
then it can retry after 30 minutes. So this kind of way we can design self-fill service. This is one basic way, but there could be a lot of uh, ways we can add these categories and uh, put logic in a way that it can understand the system better. It can analyze the pipeline failures better and re, uh, re-trigger it. That's one way. Second way, user itself, uh, the pipeline developer itself can say that, hey, there could be issue due to some other service that they are interacting with. And in that case, please retry after an hour or so. Uh, retry my workflow, retry my task, anything after an hour or so. This could be another way where user knows their workflow and knows what they are interacting with. It could not only be grid, they, are, they might be interacting with their service and can re-trigger like this. See, so the first part that you just explained, it could be based on the logs analysis of the thing that you are receiving. Yes, about. yes. So all the job failures, alerting that we get, uh, the logs, we can move to central system. We can analyze those and can uh, implement a cycle based on that. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, this is Rezvana. Uh, All of you, great presentation. Uh, I have a question for Amber. Um, So you talked about using embedding in the retrieval stage. Do you have any idea or like how frequently the embedding is updated? And yep. it's a pre-computed embedding just to be sure. Yep. That's, a, that's a great question. So right now in our uh, current uh, system online, we actually pre-compute the memory embeddings. Mm-hmm. And the frequency we update them is uh, every day. So it's like every 24 hours, we recompute uh, the embeddings based on the features and probably members' new actions. Um, but however, uh, one of our future iteration area is that we want to be able to compute the member embeddings as frequent as possible. Um, considering member take a new action or have a new feature or job that they input into our system. That means uh, the member interest or their embedding should probably change to capture your new actions or interests. So if that's something that we want to happen, we actually are working on developing a near real-time updating system that given uh, the member actions or members new input, we're able to regenerate your embedding um, online at like probably within one minute or two minutes. Yeah, that would have been my follow-up question because uh, like LinkedIn, you also see the trending topics, right? So how do you handle this similar to Twitter? Um, Another follow-up questions I have is when you mentioned, uh, I think the title of the slide was to increase the user engagement. Mm -hmm. So what type of engagements we're focusing on? And does this engagement solely focus on only, say, the organic engagement or the ads engagement as well? And this, the embedding, do you feed it to both the system or is just focusing on only specific tasks like improving the out of network? Uh, co- yeah, uh, great yeah. question. So, for your first uh, question, it was related to, sorry, I forgot the first question. Uh, could you say it again? Yeah, uh, first question was, what type of engagement are you targeting to increase? Is it only the organic engagement or it's like engagement on ads as well? And right. okay. to, yeah, and to compute the embedding, do you, uh, do you collect both type of engagements? Right, right. Um, so actually previously I had, a, I had a slide that has detailed information about the engagement type I use. Uh, but then I was talking to our team and my tech lead was like, okay, let's get a patent before we ex- uh, expose all the information that could be like juicy. So I'll give you a brief overview. Um, the engagement type that we capture probably include um, something that you, you interacted with in your feed. It could also be uh, a job that you clicked or viewed. Um, and these type of engagement are the things that we're using in our model. We haven't started using advertisement signals yet uh, because that's not something that we're trying to serve to our member- members through out of network source, uh, but it might be something we want to consider in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Gauri and thank you for the presentation. It was very relatable to what I do every day. Uh, My question is to Amber, too. Um, So uh, these embeddings, uh, have you uh, tried making bins for item embeddings and making bins for content embeddings so that it's easier to reach, um, you know, to the 
uh, exact, uh, I guess, member or members when you're trying to compute? And do you use any of the systems like annoy index or any other nuance system in your um, retrieval? Yeah, uh, great question. That's something under our radar, although we haven't uh, we haven't run into the problem that we can't key each member by themselves yet. But if we ever run into that problem, yeah, that's some system we'll consider using. So you're not currently binning um, these embeddings? Correct. Right. Okay. And uh, which uh, systems do you use, like uh, Annoy or something for retrieval? Uh, it's an in-house developed system. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. But we do use some open source uh, libraries for our in-house system. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm actually curious on your thoughts about opportunities and challenges that Gen AI, generative AI, brings to your domain of work, like from infra pipeline or like the recommendation system in general. Is this a question for all of us or uh, for each of us? Whoever wants to take it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, I guess I, I I'll go first. Um, for my work. We are actively thinking how generative AI can help us and whether we should use it more in our system. It's definitely something we have been thinking about. Um, and in fact, LinkedIn do have pre-trained models based on a lot of the new efforts uh, like Bird, Transformers, different kinds of things. And um, yeah, I think that's definitely a real good direction for us to go with. But we also need to be really careful with the responsibilities that it comes with, especially for recommendation system. We want to control the quality. We want to make sure we are only recommending the good content and really relevant content to our members um, that we call golden contents. Um, so for us, I think that's a bigger question to think about. I can cover from pipeline side. So basically, the some of the challenges that we are seeing uh, is for model training is uh, first iterative experience, how soon you can uh, test your pipeline, iterate over it. Uh, second is caching. Uh, many times, some of the tasks are working fine and you want to test only a particular task where you are improvising. So you need caching so that you save time again and again. You don't need to waste uh, uh, wait for whole pipeline to run. Uh, third thing is versioning. Uh, let's say the previous version ran fine and you now we want to retry it again and uh, change a few things over there rather than the current version. So, And there are various other things. Uh, so those are the things that we can improvise at pipeline side uh, to help with model training uh, and uh, to help in this area. I think we're getting... Should I answer? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I think... For me, it's just like on day-to-day -day basis as a developer, um, we're pretty deep in like building the distributed systems and scaling them. So it's just kind of like um, understanding new libraries and um, maybe getting some framework for coding, but I haven't explored it a ton in terms of how it we can actually use it to like build or improve our pipelines. So much. Thank you, guys. Um, we need to pause on the live questions for now, but please feel free to hold on to your questions and network with the speakers uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Urmi, Janki, and Amber for those really engaging talks. It was awesome to get this overview of how big data and ML AI uh, plays an impactful role at LinkedIn and helps us uh, achieve our long-term vision for generating equal economic opportunity for all members in the workforce. So thank you, guys. Okay, folks, uh, we are at the end of our presentations, but please don't go anywhere. Uh, we still have a lot of fun stuff lined up for you. Um, so right uh, over the, the, the left side of, of the room, I guess, uh, is uh, our um, Rock Your Profile tables that have been set up. And feel free to stop by uh, to learn how you can amp up your LinkedIn profiles. Uh, but before you uh, do that, uh, we request you to please share your experience on social media. Uh, please tag the WIT showcase page uh, and also follow us. Uh, please use the tags LinkedIn Women Connect and LinkedIn WIT uh, in your posts. Um, and finally, please take the survey um, 
yeah, please take the survey. Uh, we'll be raffling um, LinkedIn premium subscriptions. It's going to be on a first come first serve basis. So you have about 24 hours to complete your survey, but please try to do it as soon as possible. And most, uh, last but not the least, uh, thank you all for your participation, for the really insightful questions. And um, thank you and have a fun time networking with each other and, you know. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just reminded that we also have headshots uh, that you can take. Uh, it's right over um, at the corner of the room where I'm pointing at. Uh, so uh, please stick around, network. Um, you can attend the Rocky Profile sessions and also get your headshots taken. Thank you all.